What rules were created because of you? Story 1. When I was in middle school, students would wear pajama pants because they weren't against the rules and they didn't really cause any problems. Until I decided to try it. At the time, my favorite pair of pajama pants were leopard print silk. But there was also a matching top, long sleeve, button up. I decided, what the heck, I'll wear that too. And then, just to complete the look, I grabbed those little flimsy pair of after procedure flip flops my mom had on hand. And wore those too because they were also leopard print. Everything was a few sizes too big because they were actually all belonged to my mom, and I looked fabulous. I spent all day shuffling awkwardly around in my garish outfit, and the next day the teachers announced that pajamas were no longer allowed at school. Story 2 Not me, but the intro to engineering class at UCF has a competition where groups must create a self-powered boat to race an orange around the circumference of the reflection pond. The pond is maybe a hundred feet in diameter. One year, one group used a lawnmower engine to power their boat, and the same year a group used bottle rockets. Upon starting the race, the lawnmower group's boat tipped over in the middle and poured gasoline into the pond. At the same time, the other group lit their bottle rockets, which promptly ignited all the spilled gasoline and set the pond on fire. They created a new rule after that year, no gasoline-powered boats. Story 3 at some summer thing, Texas A&M did the try and attract students, I didn't end up going there, there was a little mini engineering contest where you had to construct a four-wheeled vehicle that would go the farthest. Using an assortment of MacGyverish materials, including a balloon, some tape, a mousetrap, paper clips, tacks, and things like that, and like four Lego wheels and two axles. My group argued for a while, and honestly, we wouldn't have had anywhere near the best contraption if not for my last minute inspiration of the rule loophole exploitation, which apparently I'm better at than actual engineering. No one said all four wheels couldn't be on the same axle, and there was no strict definition of vehicle. Four Lego wheels on one axle flung by the mousetrap 25 feet, beat second place by almost double I think. Our team won TI-89s, each. That's not rule breaking, that's just damn good engineering. Story 4 I have no way of proving it, but I think McDonald's and Best Buy changed the terms of 2007 McDonald's Monopoly promotion because of me. From 2004 through 2007, and possibly after that, McDonald's partnered with Best Buy to include Best Buy Bucks in conjunction with the popular McDonald's Monopoly peel-off game pieces. Best Buy Bucks were part of the game piece attached to the sandwich in a value meal. Or, if you purchased large fries, they would be attached to the large fries as well. Every Best Buy Bucks game piece was a coupon with a value of $1. I found out you could write in self-addressed stamped envelopes, S-A-S-E, for game pieces. So I tried this in 2004, writing 30 S-A-S-E's. Each S-A-S-E returned 4 McDonald's Monopoly peel-off game pieces, and 1 Best Buy Bucks coupon. In 2005, the promotion was basically the same, so I scaled up my efforts and I wrote about 150 envelopes. In 2006, the promotion again remained basically the same, except there was one change that drastically improved the return. One in three game pieces had a value of $3. In other words, every Best Buy Bucks game piece had an expected value of $1.66 repeating. But also, as it turned out, you could redeem the coupon online and in-store raising the EV to $3.33 per game piece. So I figured out my costs. Each SASE took about 3 minutes to fully prepare, and cost 37 cents times 2 equals 74 cents in round trip postage, plus the cost of the envelopes approximately 3 cents for a net gain of $2.56 in Best Buy store credit. For every 77 cents invested, approximately a 232% gain. Effectively, it offered a 57% discount below retail. Plus, sales tax was only applied to the cash balance of the purchase. I did what anyone in college would do with this information. I recruited an army of friends and offered them 10 bucks an hour to write SASEs. Also, I bought a P.O. box for 6 months in a town in Vermont. A 30 minute drive, because there was a provision in the rules that Vermont residents may omit return postage. So paying for someone to fill out the envelopes added about 50 cents per SASE to my cost, but I saved 37 cents per SASE with the P.O. box. The P.O. box cost about 36 cents for the six months, also plus gas, etc. But in the end, the plan totally worked. My friends were happy to get some easy spare cash, and McDonald's complied with the rules of their game and fulfilled about 4,400 game piece requests. I wrote the most SASEs, but I still laid about $5,000 in expenses. 
Much of it financed thanks to a friend and acquaintances who knew that I was dead serious. The people at the post office were pretty pissed and demanded that I upgrade my P.O. box to receive mail at that volume. I told them, I'm sorry, it will never happen again, and they let it slide. They were all envelopes, so if you've ever seen how the postal service bulks envelopes in those long coroplast trays, try to imagine tens of those trays. I did return them to the post office eventually. We received just under $15,000 in Best Buy bucks. We got lucky and ran above EV. We received no low, mid, nor high level collect or win or instant prizes. We received an ungodly amount of food prize coupons, which we gave mostly to my friends, although many expired unused. However, if I recall correctly, we did win one or two five or ten dollar McDonald's gift certificates as well. Best Buy, surprisingly, had no qualms about accepting the coupons in the increments of $600 at a time in the store, and $50 online as per the terms. The first visit was a bit unusual. The manager demanded I provide an ID. I said, that's fine, I'm sure they'll be able to verify these are my game pieces. I bought tons of awesome shit. The next year, the Best Buy Bucks promotion wasn't a part of McDonald's Monopoly. And obviously, although I'm sure both companies fulfilled many more requests than just from me, they never expected such an organized, determined response, and promptly addressed the rules to ensure that they could not be taken advantage of again. Clearly, Best Buy Bucks were meant, as many coupons are, to draw consumers into a purchase. When a single consumer or a group of consumers exploits those coupons according to the terms of the offer, resulting in a $15,000 electronics giveaway, I'm sure they noticed. I sold a large amount of the coupons and purchased electronics at a slight margin just to liquidate them and cover my loans. However, I kept spending thousands of dollars in free electronics that I'd earned just by writing SASEs and playing McDonald's Monopoly. Life is as cruel as it is to consumer electronics. Most of the stuff I kept is either broken or obsolete now. Also, I lost a ton of stuff in a fire recently. It actually eased me to know that so many of the electronics I'd lost, I'd never actually bought in the first place. I thought I will only remember those things when I tell the story now. Story 5 when I was 7 to 9 years old, my friend and I did nothing but play outside all day and built all sorts of wooden forts and tree houses. We got pretty handy with our tools and our projects got bigger and bigger. One day, we found four good-sized trees about six feet apart from each other in a rough square just a stone's throw away from a neighborhood park. We decided to build the mother of all forts by making a platform in the middle of those trees about six feet off the ground. It had two feet of walls around the sides and a sturdy ladder, and eventually a second level above the first. This was a fairly small neighborhood, and everyone knew everyone else. So all the grown-ups with kids came to check it out. After a few modifications, it was deemed safe enough, and for a few weeks, all the neighborhood's kids would play in it and around it. We felt like kings. Then one day we came home from school, and it was absolutely destroyed. Apparently the county caught wind of it in its proximity to the playground and sent some guys out with chainsaws to demolish it. We were heartbroken. They told our parents that from then on we weren't allowed to build anything anymore, because the county could maybe be held liable in case someone got hurt. We gathered up our scraps, said f*** the police, and moved further into the woods and out of sight and built an even better one and several backups just in case. In hindsight, I'm 30 now, I can understand why it needed to be done, but all those years ago it seemed like the greatest tragedy ever. Story 6 my story is not one of badassery, but rather an example of thinking outside the box. In my high school physics class, we had fun doing the physics Olympics after AP tests were done and our lesson plan was complete. One of the events was seeing how many paper clips you could remove from a bin by using two AA batteries, copper wire, two nails, and a tube. The logic was to make an electromagnet, but after reading the rules and talking with the teacher, nowhere did it explicitly say that you had to make an electromagnet. I proceeded to make a shovel using the batteries as the handle, the nails as support for the wire, and tape bucket, and I reinforced it all with tape. My group got the all-time record for that event, with around 1,150 paper clips picked up in 30 seconds. We picked up over 900 more than the closest competitor. Needless to say, the rules explicitly stated that we had to make an electromagnet now, but no one will touch my group's record. Story 7 First year of university, my friend bought a sofa and an armchair from eBay for $99, including delivery. Best purchase ever. He managed to fit both of them in his tiny room. Once the university found out, they didn't like it, so they told him to get rid of them. He said no, and he managed to keep them until the end of the year. 
He put them in storage and the following September, he brought them into his new, even smaller room. Only the sofa fits, so I got the armchair. Again, the university didn't like it. They sent us both very official letters giving us 30 days to remove the furniture. We printed off the entire residency agreement and read it page by page, every word to see if there was anything forbidding us from having them. There wasn't. They had their fire tags, they didn't block any exits, and the only possible problem was if it interfered with the cleaner's job. We asked her and she was fine with it. Our rooms were the last on the rotation, so she'd sometimes sit and talk with us after she was finished. Anyway... So after 30 days, we got another letter saying that they knew we still had the furniture and we would be fined. We printed off all the documentation we needed, suited up, and went to the office to argue our case. After several months, they managed to convince the cleaner to say the furniture interfered, so we actually had to get rid of them. Our friend took them to his house. The following year, we weren't in university halls anymore, but we checked the residency documentation on their website when we noticed the guidelines for furniture were now much more specific about what you could and couldn't have in your room. Four years later, he still has those sofas. Hey guys, are you enjoying the video? If so, please like and subscribe, it really means a lot and helps the channel. Anyway, back to the stories. Story 8. I don't know for certain, but I feel pretty confident that I had the flow of traffic at a certain intersection in town changed. There was a very wide shoulder on the road that I used as a right turning lane, only to get pulled over by a policeman for passing about 5 cars on the shoulder while they waited for the traffic signal. I countered the idea to him that the shoulder there was an actual lane. There was a dividing line and it was nicely paved. No reason for us not to use this space for making right turns, although no one used it. I really was passing traffic on the shoulder but being very cautious. About three months later, the intersection is repainted with a shoulder as well as a right turn only lane. It felt great seeing as it does help traffic flow better at that crowded intersection. Story 9 When I was about 5 or 6, I saw my cousin playing with an electric roller door and I thought I'd try it too. A couple of weeks later, I was playing with it by myself. The idea was to hang on to it as it went up and then drop off at the top. After this, I'd put the door down by climbing onto my bike and hitting the wall-mounted button. At some point, I put my finger in the locking hole on the slide rail to help myself down as the door was coming down. The door crushed two knuckles and almost guillotined my finger off. Story 10. It wasn't me, but a guy I met. He had a gym class and the locker rooms were attached to the pool. So one day after the gym, everybody is showering and he decided to slip into the pool. A guy held the door open and everyone else sprayed shampoo and soap on the floor. And this guy goes like a penguin into the pool butt naked. He slides in, lands in the pool, and comes and goes, Aw yeah, until he notices that there is an old person's water aerobics class going on in there. When he visited the school years later, there was a wall built that you have to go around to get in the pool with his name on it. Story 11 when I was in high school, my school adopted a uniform policy my senior year that required us all to wear one of three colored polos and a pair of khaki pants slash shorts. In the wintertime, it would get quite cold in the school, and the only long sleeve fleece we could wear was $80 and a piece of sh** that didn't even come close to keeping you warm. I refused to buy one and then had the brilliant idea. I was going to bring a blanket to school. I looked through the entire school policy handbook and I couldn't find anything telling me that I couldn't do it, so for the entire winter I would just go and wrap myself in a blanket while in class. I then graduated that year and went back to visit for Christmas break where I was told that because of me they had added blankets to the unacceptable attire portion of the school handbook. Story 12 At my high school, nobody ever put locks on their lockers, private school with no problem with theft at all. So a group of seniors decided to pull a prank by throwing everyone's books and notes all over the floor and in the ceiling. So they changed the school policy so that locks were required and seniors didn't get to graduate until the end of the school year. So our school decided that our locks had to be bought through the school store for like $12. They all had the exact same keyhole in the back so the vice principal could open your locker if necessary. The dumb part was, these were locks we bought to keep, so I took mine apart and reverse engineered a key from the key mechanism. I made myself a key that opened everyone's locks on their locker. The school also had locks on empty lockers, so I stole some of those over time and took them apart, and put them back together so that they would only need to be turned to one number to be opened. Many students hated having to use a lock. Anyway, I ended up getting suspended about halfway through my senior year. They thought I stole a key somehow, but they soon realized I didn't break any rules by having it because I made it from a lock I bought with my own money. 
and they ended up suspending me for a week for vandalism, stealing locks. The whole ordeal made me famous among students and faculty, and I loved all the attention I got when I came back. My parents were never pissed at me. They were extremely angry at the school for how they treated me. I could go into so much detail, and this was the graduation card that they gave me. The school ended up adding rules about security and locks because of the whole ordeal. Story 13 During my sophomore year in high school, I pocketed one of the keys to our high school that I found on a counter in the main office. The school only had like three different kinds of locks, so the one key that I stole happened to unlock the exterior doors and most of the classroom doors as well. I didn't use it much, just unlocked a few shortcuts here and there. Nothing crazy. It was fun to have though. But then senior year came and we started talking about what to do for a senior prank. I got involved and told people that I had this and how much power it gave us. I soon led a group of about 50 students in planning this large-scale epic prank that we did the night after graduation. We went to the school at 2am and just caused mass chaos. We didn't break or steal anything, but just caused madness everywhere. Like moving every trash can into one room, putting alarm clocks into the ceiling panels of all the classrooms and having them all set for the same time the next day, moving a teacher's desk to another room down the hall and putting someone else's desk in its place, etc, etc. Anyway, the prank was quite successful and school the next day was total chaos for the first 4 hours. The administration was not happy and they realized that the students had a key and the bricks were shat. They ended up replacing every single lock in the school, changed external doors to use electronic locks with key cards, installed alarm systems and put cameras in all the main hallways. The cost was astronomical, something like 100000 in security renovations. Since this was outside the regular budget, they had to put in a referendum for a public vote to authorize spending $100,000 in emergency funding for the added security. The measure passed that summer. Story 14 So you guys ever heard of the McDonald's Make It Bacon promotion? Where you could add bacon to anything for $1? Yeah, it didn't last long. My friend walked up and ordered a Big Mac meal with bacon. He clarified to the confused employee he wanted his burger with bacon, and he wanted his fries to come with bacon, and yes, he wanted his Coke to come with bacon. Perplexed, the poor burger flipper complied and soon his bacon-adorned meal arrived. The employees watched as he ate quickly, but this was not enough. He went back and ordered ice cream with bacon. They balked, and the frontline workers were treated to confer with the manager. They arrived not long after to inform my friend that they would not, in fact, give him bacon on his ice cream, but would be able to give him ice cream and bacon. He agreed. Soon enough, a tray slid across the counter, a piece of bacon and ice cream. He took them both up, placed the bacon on the ice cream, looked at the manager in the eye, and took a big bite. The next day, all the banners were gone, and the promotion ended. Story 15 When I was in third grade, my class had a rule that everyone had to put their chairs on top of their desks at the end of the day to make the janitor's life a little easier. If you didn't put your chair on top of your desk and another student who stayed after class to do this did it for you, then you owed him like five kid bucks, a currency that was exclusive to the class. You earned them by reading books, doing your homework, answering questions during discussions, etc. Unfortunately for everyone else, a group of friends and I lived within walking distance of the school, meaning that we had time to hang out while all the other bus kids had to rush so they didn't miss their ride home. We had a lucrative business of just hanging out after class, putting people's chairs on their desks, and collecting the next day. We had a five-ish minute window where we had to just sit and wait to make sure that no one would come back to put their chairs up. Being the third grader I was, I'm 20 now, I thought the words boob, boobies, jugs, melons, etc. were hilarious. My friends and I had this genius idea to go to a computer and type in boobs.com and see what would pop up. We were pleasantly surprised as a large-breasted woman appeared. We tried giantmelons.com, hugeboobs.com, etc. This went on for a couple of weeks. Everyone would leave and we would type in boobs.com, giggle for a few minutes, and then put off the chairs and leave. One day, the teacher called us out to the hallway to talk. She begins with, Do you all know what pornography is? As a third grader who was decently sheltered at home, I had no idea. One of my friends, on the other hand, starts to giggle and say yes. The teacher explains that it is bad and someone had been searching for pornography on the school's computers. We didn't know how to clear the history yet and the incognito windows didn't exist for our use, especially with Netscape. Later in the day, she announces to the class that the chair rule is now gone and she would do it herself. 
I thought that was the end of it, but sadly when we tried to go to boobs.com on a school computer later that week, we were met with a page saying this is against school policy. No more boobs.com? We figured out ways around it, but soon all porn was blocked.